Well, good morning, Grace Point. Let's stand and worship. Let's clap our hands. So glad you're here. Welcome to Grace Point, guys. God bless you, and you may be seated. We want to welcome everybody to worship with us here at Grace Point Church on this cold South Florida morning. How many of you are from someplace else? How many of you would go to the beach today? Okay. <laughs> Do we have some New Englanders here today? We, uh, we're so glad you guys are here today. And you know what? We hope that you find the spirit, the fellowship, the atmosphere among our Grace Point family 
We hope you feel warm. We hope you feel welcome uh, here with us today. And uh, so do me a favor, just turn to the person next to you, give them a big smile. If you don't know somebody sitting behind you, give them a handshake and maybe a little fist bump if you're uh, trying to be safe. Say good morning and welcome them. All right. All right. Now, how many of you hate when we do that? Let me see your hands. Do we have any people that just, okay, oh, you're willing to admit it? I know, I know, I know. I'm sorry for putting pressure on you there, but we do just want to say good morning and welcome. My name is Stephen. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace Point, and uh, this month we're studying the book of Leviticus, and we're talking about the holiness of God. And I wonder, is there anybody here that's ever been to the Holy Land? Anybody been on a trip to the Holy Land? It's unbelievable, right? Would anybody like to go to the Holy Land? How many would like to go right now? I'm going to take you. Are you ready? I'm going to take you to the Holy Land right now. Are you ready? Why do they call it the Holy Land? Why is this, this land so special, set apart, different than any other dirt on this planet. Listen to these words. Pastor Paul, help me back there with the noise, okay? Thanks, as people are coming in. Psalm 48, listen to these words. It's, this is the Holy Land experience right out of the pages of Scripture. It says, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. In the city of our God, the mountain of His holiness. Beautiful in its loftiness. It's the joy of the whole earth. Like the heights of Zaphon's Mount Zion is the city of the great king. He's talking about Jerusalem. He's talking about the holy city. Listen to these words. Verse 8 says, As we have heard, so have we seen. In the city of the Lord Almighty, in the city of our God, God makes her secure forever the holy city of Jerusalem. And then he goes on. He says, not only do we see the holy city in the Holy Land, but he says we see the holy place. Within that city, there is the most holy place. It says, within your temple, O God, we meditate on your unfailing love. So when you land in Israel and you want to see the Holy Land, obviously that journey is going to take you not just from the Promised Land, but it's going to take you to the city, to Jerusalem. Once you're in Jerusalem, then you want to go to the place, the holy place, the temple. Within that temple is the Holy of Holies. And then listen to these words that the the psalmist gives us. He says, like your name, O God, your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Mount Zion rejoices. The villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments. Walk about Zion. He's saying, hey, uh, he's saying, I'm going to be your travel agent. I'm going to be your tour, tour guide. Let's walk around Zion. Go around her. Count her towers. It's a sightseeing trip here. He says, consider well her ramparts, view her citadels, that you may tell of them to the next generation. And then listen to these words. Remember this this whole psalm began, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And then then listen to this. After we take this tour of this scenic uh, route through the Holy Land, it says, for this God is our God forever and ever, and he will be our guide, even to the end. Now, how many of you want to go on that tour? It's beautiful, isn't it? The greatness of our God, the vision of, of God that we see here. He says, what makes the holy land holy is that you can go to Jerusalem, and what makes Jerusalem so special is because when you're in Jerusalem, you can go to the temple. And what makes the temple so special is that when you get into that place, 
you can find not just the holy city, not just the holy place, but you can meet the Holy One. This God is our God forever and ever, and He will be our guide until the end. So why are we here today? We're here today because we want the guided tour. Some of you came this morning and what we need, what you need is a guided tour through marriage or through business or through work or through emotions or through pain. Some of you are on a tour right now through difficulty and you need, you need the Lord to be your guide and to lead you through the hard times. Can I get an amen? Anybody need Jesus to be their tour guide? How many of you are glad he's not just a travel agent? He'll go with you. He'll be with you. Maybe some of you here this morning, you know what you need? You need a tour guide, not about this world and the pain and the difficulty we face in this world. How many of you are ready to take a tour of heaven someday? And you want him to bring you into the very presence, into that presence of God for all of eternity. Maybe you're listening online this morning. You're joining us online. Or maybe you're here and you've never received Christ as your Savior. Oh, today's the day. Today's the day, and we want to invite you to join us on this tour. Let's bow our hearts together. We're going to pray. We're going to continue to worship. We're going to, just a few moments, we're going to open God's word, and, and we want to hear his voice. But more than anything, Lord, today, we want to see your face. Lord, thank you that you are great. You are mighty. Lord, your greatness, we can't even understand we're just finite, mortal, sinful, imperfect, broken people. And Lord, we know that you are a perfect God. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And Father, thank you that this God is our God. And you will be with us. Lord, we ask you today, be our guide. Not just this morning, but Lord, this week, this month, this year. Lord, in this life, as we go forward, would you guide us? Would you help us? Would you teach us? We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you promised you'd never leave us. So, Lord, today, for those that are hurting, would you just wrap your arms around them? That, Lord, even use this time as we worship, as we fellowship, to be a time to remind us of your presence that's so real, that's so close, Lord, for, for folks that maybe are looking for hope, looking for help, looking for Jesus, Father, today we just pray that we would make the gospel so clear that, Lord, Jesus would be so visible today that it would be easy for people to say, yes, I want to turn away from my sin. I want to turn away from myself, and I want to turn toward Jesus and put my life in his hands. I want to trust Christ today. Lord, that's what we've come to do. So we ask you now, guide us. Oh, thou great Jehovah, Lord, lead us today. And lead us now to the throne of grace as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen. amen. Let's all stand and sing this song. I know you guys all know this song. Let's sing, Oh Lord my God. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my 
Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! How great Thou art! And when I think that God is Son, not spirit. can't take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin sings out then sings my soul my savior God to thee my soul, my Savior God to me. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. This sing this out. Then sings my soul. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art. Let me, you guys, let me hear you guys sing this out. Then sings. Then sings my soul. I didn't plan on doing this, but I want to sing that chorus one last time. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul. Think about how awesome our God is. And our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. And our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Just the voice. Our God. Is an awesome God, he reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Man. Amen. 
Amen. We have one more song, and then we're going to go to the message. Let's listen to these words. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the oceans. I need you now to do the same thing for me. Come on, we need our God. Amen. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. I'm calling on the God of Mary, whose favor rests upon the lowly. I know with you all things are possible. I'm calling on the God of David, who made a shepherd boy courageous. face Goliath, but I've got my own giants. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. your children and you hear your children now you are the same God you are the same God you answered prayers back then and you will answer now you are the same God you are the same God you were providing men you are providing now you are the same god you are the same god you moved in power then god moved in power now you are the same god you are the same god you are a healer then you the same God. You are the same God. You are a Savior then. You are a Savior now. You are the same God. You are the same God. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you Oh, rock, oh, rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. 
There's a great verse in the New Testament where these folks said, Sirs, we would see Jesus. And that's what we want to do right now. So let's take our Bible. Turn to Leviticus chapter 11. Leviticus chapter 11. We're going to begin reading in verse 44. We're going to read just two verses today as we continue our series called Cancel Culture. Now, of course, the world we live in is a cancel culture. What we found last week is that heaven is a cancel culture too, but in a very different way. You see, the world cancels people, but Jesus cancels sin. And what Leviticus does is it teaches us, it shows us a way that broken, sinful, imperfect people can live in the presence of a perfect, infinite, um, loving, holy God. Now, one of the things that I have kind of just found in my life is that I always want to have a sense of God's vision for my life. Are you like me? Do you have that sense? In other words, I want to know what, what does God have for me? What does God want me to do? Who does he want me to be? As a pastor, I, we always want, we pray for God's vision for our church. How many of you would like to know God's vision for your life, right? I've always thought that uh, I heard a definition of vision one time. You might want to write this down. This isn't really what the sermon's about today, but it's a great definition of vision. Vision is a picture of what God wants to do. Now, how many of you want God's vision for your life? Most Christians I have found, in fact, I think most people want to, want, want to have a sense of God's vision for their life. But what I want you to see today is this principle, that we all want a vision from God, but the reality is God's vision for your life, a vision from God, always begins with a vision of God. You believe that? In other words, you're going to have a greater clarity and you're going to have more of a sense of purpose and direction and meaning in your life to the degree that you have a clear vision of who God is. Now, are there any artists here today? Anybody that's an artist? Okay. Did you know that uh, the average salary of a sketch artist is $65,000? And did you know that there are only about two dozen full-time sketch artists in the United States of America. Out of 350 million people, there's only about 24 people who make their living doing what we think of as a sketch artist on TV, on all these shows like CSI and Law and & Order and dun dun and, and all those shows, the process shows, the, the true crime TV series that my mother is addicted to. And... Uh, and so they always have the sketch artist, right? And they come in and the poli- people are in the police station. They say, what did she look like? What did he look like? How old were they? And what kind of facial features can you describe? Did you know that real life sketch artists is a dying breed? There are more artists than there are jobs. And that if you're a, a talented artist, uh, career counselors will tell you, you probably ought to become a graphic designer because there's such a high demand for graphic design, there really is not all that much demand, as if you can imagine it, for sketch artists. But what if I were to say to you, um, by the way, has anybody here ever witnessed a crime and, and sat with an artist and had them ask you, what did they look like? Did you know that um, 100% of witnesses tell sketch artists when they sit down to begin that there's no way that they remember enough to to make a good sketch. How many people say when they sit down, I don't remember enough, I I was so fast, 100%. Everybody says, "I, I, I can't remember what they looked like enough to make a sketch. I just remember a couple things. Well, a couple things is often enough to get a picture. And what's interesting is when you think about it, Moses might be the first sketch artist. 
Because in Leviticus, what he's going to do here in chapter 11, verses 44 to 45, he's going to be like a biblical sketch artist, and he's going to tell us three distinguishing characteristics about the face of God. That if you're looking for God and you can't find him, maybe what you ought to do is stop looking for him and start worshiping him, and he will find you. Look at what it says in Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 44. And let's see if we can get a vision of God today. Leviticus 11 verse 44. It says, now, I am the Lord. Say that with me. I am. Remember in the gospel of John, eight times we hear Jesus say, I am. Seven times he says, I am something. He says, I am the light of the world. I'm the bread of life. I'm the door. I'm the gate. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and life. I am. He says this. And then on the eighth time, he says, before Abraham was, I am. Why is that phrase so potent? Why is that phrase so pregnant with meaning in the Bible, because it's, it's the way that Moses went to God, and when he was going to Pharaoh, he said, who shall I say sent me? God said to Moses, you just tell him, I am sent you. I am, and Jesus said, I am, before Abraham was, I am. And Leviticus eleven forty four, God says to Moses, I am the Lord your God. Now, look at that word God right there. Now, let's get real basic and simple. We came to church today, so let's talk about God. Everybody with me? God. Now, the word there in chapter 11, verse 44 for God is the word Elohim. Now, that's the word that's repeated throughout Genesis 1. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And all through Genesis 1, it says Elohim. He says, I am the Lord, your God, your Elohim. And then he says this, consecrate yourselves and be holy. Because here's that phrase again, I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. Look at verse 45. Say it with me. I am the Lord. Who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. Four times we hear these words, this refrain, I am. One time, it's the same thing. He says, I am holy. But notice the first time he says, I am the Lord your God. He says, I am your Elohim. I am your God. The second time he says, I am the Lord. And if you look in your Bible, you'll notice that the word Lord there is in all caps. You see that? In Isaiah 6, when he says, I saw the Lord, and he heard the seraphim, and what were they saying? Holy, holy, holy. It's the only time in the Bible the attribute of God, the characteristic of God, is repeated three times for emphasis. That what is the one characteristic of God? If you're trying to describe God to a sketch artist, you would say, well, all I remember is holy, holy, holy. But that word Lord there is in all caps. Now, there's different words, obviously, Hebrew words that we translate for God or Lord. And so the first one is Elohim. In the beginning, God. That's the first picture that we have. He says, I am the Lord your God. But then he says, I am the Lord, all caps, is the word Yahweh. Are any of you familiar with this fascinating thing in Scripture that in Genesis chapter 1, there's an account of creation, and in Genesis chapter 2, there's another account of creation. Are you aware of this? They don't conflict. They're just, God tells the story of creation twice. And what's fascinating is, that in chapter 1, the word that is repeated is Elohim. And in chapter 2, if you look at Genesis 2, verse 4, it says, now the Lord God created the heavens and the earth. Well, what's the difference? Well, Elohim is the common name 
for God. Yahweh is the covenant name of God. See, he is Elohim to the whole planet, to the butterflies and the caterpillars and the bulls and uh, the broncos and the dolphins and all the teams, right? He is Elohim, all creatures of our God and King. In other words, we are all God's creatures. He is the God of creation. He is Elohim. But listen to this. <clears throat> He's more than just the creator God. He's also a covenant God. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, He is not just your God. He's not just your Elohim who created you, but He is your Yahweh who has saved you. Now, uh, that's a very important thing. So we're, we're talking to this sketch artist here. We're saying what God is like. And here's what we've got so far. Number one, you can write this down. What we see is that our God, first of all, is an awesome God. We just sang those words a moment ago. Our God is an awesome God. I am the Lord, your God. Look at what he's done. He says, Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I'm holy. Don't make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. What is he talking about? He's, he's hearkening back to the issue of creation. He's talking about things from heaven, things of earth. He's saying the things that move along the ground. He's saying you're not supposed to be like this. You're not supposed to be part of this unclean world that I want you to be clean. I want you to be pure, be holy like me. He says First of all, if you want to understand who God is, if you want to paint a picture, you, you got to understand our God is, a, is an awesome God. He spoke the universe into creation. Incidentally, are you aware that there's really only one miracle? People say, oh, well, you got to believe in all these miracles. When I was in college at Florida State, the Harvard of the South, my philosophy... <laughs> Of religion professor, he felt that his job was to strip young people of their faith. I mean, his motivating, his animating principle of his life was to try to tear down people's faith and people's sense of that there is something more than just cells and plasma and dirt and rocks and birds and animals, that there's more to life than just what you can see. He wanted people to not believe that there was something more, that there was someone more. And after sitting in his class, he was a very intelligent, articulate man with a very prominent worldview that he was pushing like a used car salesman on all of us in his class. And, I, and I'm convinced, well-intentioned, you know, he wasn't a bad person. He wasn't an evil man. He thought he was right. He thought he was helping us by delivering us from this ancient, archaic, mythical, legendary, you know, worldview that he thought was empty and vacant and, and couldn't help and didn't have any solutions for the world. I remember at one point, he, he thought he had really, uh, fit, it was like his closing argument. He tied a bow on it. And his big thing was that God never parted the waters of the Red Sea. He had proved it. He knew he could prove it conclusively. This is a philosophy of religion professor and a class at a major university. And he, he taught us that there, the, the whole miracle of, of parting the Red Sea never happened. That in that day and age, in that culture, there was this thing called the Sea of Reeds. And there's only one Hebrew letter difference between the Red Sea and the Sea of Reeds. And that the Sea of Reeds was this area that would be kind of like the Everglades, like swampland. And that there would be several months out of the year that the, the land would be dry ground. And so, of course, we all know as educated, erudite, pointy-headed people who's, you know, we have more degrees than a thermometer, but we can't spell the Bible. And he said, of course, we know. Some monk must have just written it wrong. And instead of God telling Moses to part the Red Sea, it was the Sea of Reeds, and that basically it was no miracle at all. 
They just marched through the swampland during the dry season. And he put his, it was like a mic drop moment. Boom. And he like looked at all of us like, now, are you with me? And I raised my hand. True story. I raised my hand from the back of the room. I said, Professor, I said, you have discovered the, perhaps the greatest miracle in all the Bible. I said, this is amazing. You should publish this. And he and I had already had a few conversations, so he, he knew not to trust me. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, Professor, you're telling me that God drowned Pharaoh's army in eight inches of water? In the swamp? This is even a bigger miracle than parting the Red Sea. But the, the point is this. To believe in the Bible and to believe in God, you don't have to believe all these miracles. Here's why. Because there's really only one miracle. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If God created the universe, could he make a virgin girl pregnant in Palestine 2000? Yeah, that's not a big deal, is it? If you can create the universe, can you keep a guy alive in the belly of a fish for three days? Yeah. There's, don't have problems on the things that aren't problems. There's really only one miracle, and really the only miracle, can I, can I even get you one step further? People say, the only miracle is in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then people get all wound up and, and all, all riled up about creation, which I'm all for. I believe God created the heavens and the earth. But can I tell you, you don't even have to get to the word creation. Say it with me. In the beginning, God. But right there. In the beginning, God. Friends, let me tell you about my theology. My theology is this. In the beginning, God, dot, dot, dot. Everything else is a postscript. If you accept the self-evident truth that God exists, you don't need a travel agent to get you around life mentally. In fact, <clears throat> J.I. Packer, the author of the great book Knowing God, said, once you realize the main business of life is knowing God, you'll find out that once you know God, most of the other problems in life work themselves out. Our God, first of all, is an awesome God. He's the God of creation. He's outside of time and space. He's infinite and perfect. He is holy. Look at, look at Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 17. Just look at the screen. Deuteronomy 10 verse 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God. You might want to just write down that word great, his greatness. What do we mean when we say our God is an awesome God? We speak, first of all, of his greatness. He is the great God, mighty and awesome. But then notice this, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. Just write down the word goodness. See, when we say our God is an awesome God, what we're trying to do is Moses is telling us, like a sketch artist, if you're looking for God, let me tell you what he's like. He's awesome. He created everything. He is great and he is good. Do you know that theologians describe the attributes of God with two categories? They have what are called the incommunicable uh, attributes of God and the communicable attributes of God. Raise your hand if that makes you feel smart that you heard that sentence. Okay, It makes me feel smart that I said it. I think I pronounced it right. I'm not sure. There's these two aspects of God's character, his attributes. There are the incommunicable ones, which means he can't communicate. He can't share them. In other words, they are his and his alone. There are the communicable ones. They are the ones that we can possess to some degree, never to the extent that he has them. How many think God is love? Okay. How many love their family and their children and their spouse? You know, we can love. That's communicable. How many can be merciful? Is God merciful? Is God just? Is he good? Is he truthful? Is he wise? Sure. <clears throat> and there are many things that we can be <clears throat> to some extent. They are communicable. 
There are things we share with him. There are other attributes that are incommunicable. <clears throat> Is there anyone here omniscient? Can you be a little omnipotent? Can you be sort of omnipresent? No. In other words, God is omniscient. He knows everything. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. And he is holy. Is there anybody in here holy? Can you be a little holy? No. Uh, here's the principle. What Moses is saying is this. If you want to see Jesus, if you want to see God, you got to understand, first of all, he's an awesome God. Are you ready for the great news? It gets better than that. He's not just an awesome God. Number two, write this down. He is a personal God. He is a personal God. Go back to verse 44. I am the Lord your God. Look at verse 45. I am the the Lord, all caps, Yahweh. Now remember that verse in John 1.1 1, 1 that says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14 goes on to say, And the Word became flesh. Now let's be honest. How many of us, when you've heard that verse a thousand times, In the beginning was the Word, Word was with God, Word was God, Word became flesh. Honestly, how many of you have privately thought to yourself, what in the world does it mean that the Word was with God? Why doesn't it just say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh? Doesn't that all we need to know? Have you ever thought that, or is it just me? I've seen a lot of, you have a wild look of alarm on your face. <laughs> Has anybody ever wondered, what's that all about? The Word was with God. Why is that significant? Because God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have lived in community. They have lived in perfect harmony and fellowship. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit, three in one, have lived in divine union eternally. So when Jesus says the greatest commandment, it's not just to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but the second is just like it. Meaning, if you do the first one, you got to do the second one or else you're not doing the first one. The byproduct of loving God is loving who? Your neighbor as yourself. God created us for fellowship. Why? Because God is in fellowship. Jesus wasn't just the Word who was God, who became flesh, he was the Word of God who was with God and became flesh so that he could help us to also be with God and enjoy fellowship with one another. True or false? Are you ready? Don't shout out your answer if you're afraid of being wrong or going to be embarrassed if you're wrong. I'm telling you ahead of time, it's a trick question. True or false? All I need is Jesus. True or false? All I need is Jesus. Friend, listen to me. Listen to me. First of all, I'm not the scorekeeper. I don't know. You can ask him when you get to heaven. It's a semantic question, isn't it? In other words, it's a nuanced issue. If all we need is Jesus, why are we here? right now. Why are you here in this room? Why do you need to be in this room? Why do I need to be here teaching this book? In other words, God created us for fellowship. He created you. Friend, if you're here today and you've accepted Christ as your Savior, do you know that being a Christian is one thing you can't do all by yourself? You can't do it. If I was on an airplane that crashed and I wound up on a deserted island, you know what I'd do? I'd look for a volleyball to join my men's small group. Yeah. I'd start trying to find Wilson. Because we need fellowship. Why? First of all, because our God is an awesome God. 
Secondly, because our God is a personal God. He's not just Elohim, the creator, but he is Yahweh who makes his covenant with his people. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Could Moses trust Yahweh? Could Moses trust Jehovah? You better believe he could. Can you trust him? Can you love him? Friends, he's not a concept to be admired. He's not a system to be analyzed. He's a father to be worshipped and adored and trusted and served. And friends, the God who is there is the God you can know. And that's what Leviticus says. That's the pictures coming into focus. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is a personal God. Now, just for fun, look at Jeremiah 29, verses 11 to 13 on the screen. Jeremiah 29, verses 11 to 13. It's three verses, but I want to read all the way through it. I'm going to pick on my mom here today. Mom, will you help me out? Okay? And... Um, Dad, you help too to make sure the math is right. I know the English will be right. <clears throat> Can you help me count all the pronouns in these three verses? And any of you other English honors AP students, feel free to join right in. Are you ready? By the way, have you noticed that everybody's real interested in what your pronouns are? <laughs> I heard a political candidate recently say his pronouns were sick and tired, but that's another story. <laughs> Listen to this. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Look at verse 12. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to to you. Are you getting a headache yet from trying to keep track? Seven, five, four, twelve. Just trying to confuse you. Keep you on your game. Look at verse 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Are you getting the idea that this relationship with God is supposed to be a me and you thing? The, the relationship with God is not about this and that. Your relationship with God will change when it stops being about this and that and starts being about me and you <clears throat> and getting up close and personal with him. Friends, our God is an awesome God. Our God is a personal God. He is the God you can know. But there's a third distinguishing feature that Moses is going to give us here. He says it twice so we don't miss it. He says, I'm the Lord your God. He says, I am the Lord. Look at the end of verse 45. I am the Lord, verse 45, who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. Friends, our God is the holy God. DeMar Hamlin had a heart attack in Cincinnati on a football field on Monday night a couple weeks ago. It became this huge story. Did you hear all the commentators on ESPN just not knowing what to say? Because this wasn't about a football game. This is about a life, a human being. How many times that night did I hear the words, this is unprecedented. This has never happened before. We've never seen this. We've seen injuries. We've seen spinal injuries. We've seen paralysis. We've never seen CPR on a football field. How many of you know that a commentator on ESPN the next day, live on television, prayed for DeMar Hamlin 
This guy, Dan Orlovsky, a career backup quarterback with the Detroit Lions, who's a, who's a, a new commentator the last couple years on ESPN, he said, I don't know whether I'm going to get in trouble for doing this or not, but I'm going to pray for DeMar Hamlin right now. And what he said, he said it in a very clever way. He said, everybody keeps talking about we're praying for DeMar Hamlin. In other words, it's okay to say we're praying. Is it okay to pray? And so he prays for, for God to heal DeMar Hamlin. Incidentally, I have a buddy who's a, a yacht captain and a, an airline pilot, a senior pilot with JetBlue. And he and I have often talked over the years that when you're the captain of a ship or the pilot of an airplane, they are passengers. They are customers until there's a crisis. And when there's a crisis, those customers, those passengers become, do you know what the airlines and the ship, shipping companies call them? Souls. Friends, they may be, my, my mom and dad may have been passengers on Holland America yesterday when I picked you up at the port. But I'm going to tell you, those people on the Titanic were souls. You know what that is? That's a pretty good definition of the word holy. Because what holiness means, the word holy means set apart. It means different. And can I tell you, Bengals Stadium became holy ground the other night. Did you notice? There weren't any more arguing back and forth. There weren't any yellow flags being thrown. There was no trash talking. It was all the players gathered at the 50-yard line on their knees praying for their brother, praying for their friend. Some of those bingo players didn't even know DeMar Hamlin. But it was holy ground, and they were praying for him. You see, Adrian Rogers says, or said, he says it in heaven now, but he still believes it. I can tell you he believes it more now than he did when he was here. Adrian Rogers says, holiness is not the way to Christ. Christ is the way to holiness. You come to Christ and you receive his goodness, his greatness, his grace, his presence in your life, and then he begins to make you different and set apart and sanctified. How many of you are perfect? Can I see your hands? Anybody in here? Maybe one or two husbands. I saw one hand back there, a couple of <laughs> a couple husbands. All right. Maybe just one or two of you. I know, I know how you feel. I used to feel that way. Um, how many of you may not be perfect and may not be all you're supposed to be, but you're not what you were? He's already at work in us and, and changing us. I'm not all I'm going to be. I'm not all I should be, but I'm not what I was. I got a great verse for you. Are you ready? The other week I talked about Pink Floyd and I felt bad leaving out Led Zeppelin. So I'm just going <laughs> to I'm going to give you the gospel according to Robert Plant. Are you ready? Look at Isaiah 35 and verse 8. Guys, do we have that? Isaiah 35 and verse 8. Are you ready? Every rock and roll fan in the world is familiar with the stairway to heaven. But you realize, friends, that's bad theology. There, there's no stairway to heaven. You can't climb. Nobody is climbing their way to heaven. If there was a stairway, you would never make it. I would never make it. Because Jesus said, here's the standard. If you want to climb... You want to get there on your own? Here's the ticket to heaven. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. A kind of Jesus' version of the mic drop, right? If there was a stairway, the only way you could get there is if you were absolutely perfect. But it says this, there may not be a stairway to heaven, but there's a highway to heaven. And a highway will be there. 
Isaiah said. It'll be called the way. I love that word. Isaiah, hundreds and hundreds of years before the time of Jesus. He says, listen, don't worry about the stairway. There's a highway to heaven. And it's going to be called the way. There's going to be a way to get to heaven. Remember Jesus said, familiar phrase, isn't it? I am the way. Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? I am the way. Reminds me of the great theologian George Bailey in It's a Wonderful Life. When George Bailey is sitting, Jimmy Stewart is sitting at the bar and he's done, he's finished, he's empty. He doesn't have, he can't solve his problems. And he says, God, I'm not a praying man. But if you're up there, show me the way. Joe, just show me the way. It's like God is saying, I showed you the way 3,000 years ago. I had one of my sketch artists draft it for you. He says, there's going to be a highway to heaven. It's going to be called the way of holiness. It will be the, for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. She's not climbing the stairway to heaven. Let me tell you about, speaking of pronouns, speaking of her, she's not climbing the stairway to he of heaven. If she's going to heaven, it's going to be on a highway, and it means she got on the bus. Noah would call it an ark. Jesus would call it his church. And the only question is, we're all souls. The only question is, are you still drowning in the ocean of sin? Or have you accepted the lifeline that he has offered you? And have you come into the ark? Have you gotten on the bus? It's, friend, it's the way of holiness. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. My dad sent me a video the other day about Alistair Begg. Have you ever heard of this guy? He's this Scottish preacher in Ohio. I think it's a church in Cleveland. And uh, all good things come from Ohio, right, Paul? <laughs> Alistair Begg says, when you stand before God and he says, why should I let you into my heaven? Here's what Alistair Begg says about pronouns. He says, if your answer starts with a personal pronoun, you're in trouble. Why should you go to heaven? Well, I. I went to church. I read the Bible. I tried to help people. I do the best I can. I'm a good person. If your answer starts with you, you're in trouble. But when somebody says, why should you go to heaven? If your answer starts with Jesus and what he has done for you and that he has saved you by grace through faith in Christ, he says, that, that's what you need. And he tells a funny story. The preacher, he's got this great Scottish brogue, and he's a real scholarly guy, a pastor theologian, and he tells this story. He says, think about that thief on the cross. You know, there's two men crucified on either side of Jesus, and at one point, they were both hurling insults at him. And then at one point, Watching Jesus suffer and die, this one thief looks to him and he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He doesn't say, I would like to ask Jesus into my heart. He doesn't join the church. He doesn't get baptized. He doesn't fill out a doctrinal questionnaire. He doesn't take a personality test. He doesn't sign up to serve at the temple. He doesn't give any money. He just says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Alistair Begg says he imagines that man making it to the front door of heaven and running into an angel there at the gate who's got the reservations. And he, he walks up to him and he says, uh, what temple, what church did you go to? And the guy says, I didn't ever go to church. I was a crook. 
And the angel says to him, well, did you, uh, were you perfect even as your father? Oh, no, 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 not me. And the guy says, well, what did you believe about uh, the doctrine of justification? You got your doctrine in order? You understand everything? Uh, I don't, doctrine of what? <clears throat> and the angel says, uh, I don't know what to do with you. Let me go get a supervisor. And the, the supervising angel comes out and he says, wait a minute, have you been baptized? No. Did you join a church? No. What's your favorite Bible verse? No. Do you have any Christian t-shirts? No. And he says, well, what on earth makes you think you can get into heaven? And the guy says, all I know is the man on the cross in the middle told me I could come. And that's all I know. I don't know anything else. By grace, through faith, in Christ alone. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is a personal God. Our God is a holy God. And speaking of holiness as we close, did you know that the most famous sketch artist in America for the last 30 years has been a woman named Lois Gibson in Houston, Texas. I said speaking of holiness because you know what she did before she was a sketch artist for the Houston Police Department? She had been a Playboy model. But she liked to draw and she went down to the Houston Police Station and she said, I'd like to be a sketch artist. She did a couple sketches. They didn't do anything. But on the third sketch, they caught the person. And over the next 30 years, she became the most prolific sketch artist in American history. She has, her sketches have led to the arrest and conviction of over 1,000 criminals in Houston, Texas. She's the woman who said 100% of the people who witness a crime say, I don't know enough to help you. I don't remember that much. I only remember one or two things. Here's what she said. She said, the key to being a great sketch artist isn't necessarily artistic talent, although you have to be able to draw. She said, the secret is not how well you can draw. All the good artists can draw. That's what makes them artists. The secret, she said, was her ability to listen closely and interpret what the person is saying. And, most importantly, try to help them remember everything that they saw. Lois Gibson once drew a sketch of a criminal named Charles Rayford. And when the picture was put on television, it was so good, it looked like she had traced a picture of him with a black pencil. The picture of Charles Rayford was so good that when Rayford saw the picture on television, he just went down to the station and turned himself in. <laughs> Are you ready? Are you ready? Here's the question. What if your life depended on your memory and your vision of who God is? What if everything about your life was all about your ability to know him? And what if you discovered this morning, like never before, that he is a holy God and you and I are broken, imperfect people. And the only way to avoid eternal separation from God, ultimately, the death penalty, would be to find grace and find forgiveness and find hope and get on the highway to heaven because of what Jesus did for you. Can I just say it this way? Is there anybody here today that's ready to turn yourself in? Are you ready to just come, walk into the precinct in heaven, and just turn yourself in?
And if they say, why should you go to heaven? I know what I would say. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. With all the things I've done, with all the things I've said, with all the things I've thought, with all the things I would have done if I'd have, had, if I'd have been in the wrong place at the wrong time, with all the things I didn't do that I could have done. When I look at my life, there's no way. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I know I don't measure up to God's standard because I don't measure up to my standard. But God demonstrated his love and that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. And I'm trusting Jesus Christ alone for eternal life. I'm going to ask you today to turn yourself in. Just give your life to Christ. Maybe you're a believer. You've already accepted Christ. But maybe you've been on the run a little bit. And today's the day you need to get back on the highway. And follow Jesus. Let's bow our heads and pray. If you're online or if you're here today and God is dealing with you, you'll know it. It's like he's knocking on the door of your heart. He's calling your name. Would you just say yes to him? If you're lost and you need Jesus, just say yes. Open your heart and let him come in. God, forgive us, cleanse us, change us. Somebody here is praying this prayer today. Jesus, come into my heart. Change me. The best I know how I put my life in your hands. If that's your prayer, just make that your prayer. Say, yes, Lord. Come into my life. Come in today. Come in to stay. Just come into my life, Lord Jesus. If you're a believer, make that your prayer. Father, today, I want to go God's way. I want to be, in the, I want to be on the bus. I want to be in the boat. I want to be on the highway to heaven, trusting you for every part, every piece of my life and of the journey. Father, seal these words in our hearts. For Christ's sake, in whose name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's stand up and worship. But before we sing this song, I want to teach it to you. I want to sing the chorus. This song is our response to how good God is. It says, so I'll throw up my hands and praise you again and again. And we're throwing up our hands and we're raising our hands in a response of how good God is and we're just praising him. It's one way of praising him. And we could lower our hands like this. And it's saying we're going to praise you again and again because all we have is a hallelujah. And we know it's not much, but we have nothing else fit for a king. But we have our praise for him. So I'm going to sing the chorus, and then we'll sing the song together. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Because all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I have nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. fall short I've got nothing new how could I express all my gratitude I could sing these songs as I often do 
But every song must end And you never do So I throw up my hands And praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much But I'm nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing hallelujah got one response I've got just one move with my arms stretched wide I will worship you so I throw up my hands and praise you again and again since all that I have is a heart much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, what a beautiful song. We sing hallelujah to our God. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Ooh. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord Come on, he's worthy of our praise Let's sing, come on Oh, come on, my soul Oh, don't you get shy on me Lift up your song you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord sing so I throw up my hands so I throw up my hands and praise you again and again cause all that I have is a hallelujah hallelujah and I know it's not much but I have nothing else fit for a king You are so worthy of our praise. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, just so much. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Be seated for about 30 seconds. Thank you so much, Laura and Scott and Ava, for leading us today. Give them a big hand. Appreciate you guys so much. And uh, I, I don't know about you, but I enjoyed choir practice today. Man, I heard all, all so many folks singing, and what a, what a joy to, uh, to be together and to be able to worship. We hope you'll be back Wednesday night. Kids, teenagers, celebrate recovery, 7 p.m. We've got amazing collection Bible study uh, on Wednesday nights. Next Sunday morning, 9 a.m., we've got men's group, ladies' groups. 
Uh, we've got groups that meet throughout the week, home groups and different kinds of Bible studies going on. If you want to get information, all you got to do is go to gracepoint.net and uh, click on the word belong. And you can find out all the ways you can get plugged in and get connected here at the church. If you uh, prayed to receive Christ today, would you let me know? You can email us. You can check a box on your welcome card. You should have seen one of those little welcome cards in the chair in front of you. If you don't have one, you can just go to gracepoint.net. Click on the word contact, the upper right-hand corner of our homepage. It's like an electronic welcome card. Give us your name and information. You can check the box. Today, I want to commit my life to Christ. Uh, you can put a prayer request on the back. We ask everybody who's new, do us a favor, at least give us your email so we can keep in touch with you. Every Wednesday and Saturday, we send out a little blast, tells you what's going on in the life of our church. Next Sunday morning, we're going to continue uh, our series on cancel culture. We've talked about how God is holy. We're going to look at what it means that we can be holy. We're going to talk about practically how to live it out in our lives and let God's spirit be at work. So I hope you'll be here and be a part of that. We're continuing to pray for all the folks in our church that are that are hurting and struggling, going through all kinds of difficulty. Uh, keep Bobby and Denise Goodwin in your prayers. And let's just continue to pray. I've had so many people ask me for information and what's going on in all this. Bobby told me yesterday, just tell everybody, man, all we need is everybody praying. So let's just keep praying for, uh, for them and for, for healing and for strength. Yes, ma'am, real quick. Jody and Rob Rice, Jody's having surgery, Rob's been in and out of the hospital, we want to continue to pray for the Rices and the Goodwins, and, and if you want us to pray for you, on your welcome card or on that electronic card, you can, right there, you can fill out a prayer request so we can join you in prayer. If you're a part of our Grace Point family, you can uh, drop your offering in the box on your way out, you can always give online, just go to gracepoint.net, click on the word giving, and every time you do, you're helping change the world one life at a time for the glory of God. Don't forget, on your way out today, we want to pray for you. So if you want somebody to pray for you, we've got a beautiful couple, wonderful folks that love the Lord in the back, Jacqueline and Wes Scott. And before you leave today, if you just want somebody to just pray with you and, and share uh, in prayer with you, you stop by and see them, and they would love to do that. Thank you guys so much for being here. God bless you. We we'll hope to see you next Sunday morning at 10 a.m. with somebody you know who needs to know Christ. God bless you. You're dismissed.